Okay, so welcome everybody to this fourth session of the EO for Agriculture Under Pressure. And this session is dedicated to EO-based initiative in support of food security and sustainable agriculture. I am Marie Weiss from the French National Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment, and I'm co-chairing this session with my colleague, Alisa Whitcraft from NASA. So we will have five talks during this session. Each one will last 15 minutes, followed by three minutes questions that you can ask uh, through Slido, the, the QA tabs that you have at the, on, the, on the right of your screen. And at the end of the session, we will, we will have also a 20 minute discussion, still by sharing uh, questions on Slido. And after the session, uh, we invite you to go to the recommendation booth to share all the, your ideas, uh, uh, even the most crazy ones, and comments about uh, how EO can and how EO can support national stati statistics, small order farming, crop monitoring, and yield prediction. So I think we can now listen to the first speaker, who is Ian Jarvis, and we will present the essential agricultural variables and forward research agenda from the GeoGlam Initiative. So, Ayan, please, you have 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, stop my video and share my screen. There we go. Hopefully that's uh, coming through. Yes. Uh, so, it, it's a pleasure really to be able to kick off this session and talk to you about uh, GeoGlam. I'm going to start by talking about some of our activities and the services that we've developed so far, the operational things we do. And then I really want to turn, turn it around a bit to talk about how we're currently evolving many of our activities. We have a number of new initiatives to really allow us to meet our great uh, policy challenges uh, that we see before us, the uh, SDGs being uh, one, of the, one of the key ones for sure. So GeoGlam was initiated in 2011 by the G20 uh, agriculture ministers. It was initially developed to really focus on food security, understanding that we could bring Earth observations information to the international community to improve the information that commodity markets had and hopefully uh, reduce volatility. Now, through that, we've produced a number of operational products and these are two of the first flagships. The one on the top is a crop monitor uh, for the major uh, food producing nations of the world. Um, it was produced or it is produced uh, monthly it was initially produced in 2013 and it's delivered every month to the agriculture market information system which are really the economists from all the countries that uh, handle the stocks and balances and so on and this product was made uh, with an eye to what economists would like to see from earth observations information and some of the real benefits of both these crop monitors is that it uh, it not only brings together science-based information from Earth observations and AgMet and so on, but it also brings together on the ground expertise from around the world. So every month for the Amos Crop Monitor, for instance, um, we have uh, up to 40 people convening to discuss conditions as well as look at all the information. And the value of that is at the end of that process, they're able to uh, publish what is a consensus report and that consensus gives it great strength and authority and it's been used and very useful for markets as well as uh, national level and, and other levels to inform uh, food production. Now based on the success of that in 2016 we launched the crop monitor for early warning and it has the same kind of look and feel as the Amos crop monitor but it focuses on uh, key food insecure regions of the world. And this example gives you Africa. Uh, and also it focuses on uh, not just the main commodity crops, but crops that are specific, regionally specific and important for food security in these regions. So it varies by region. And that's been produced monthly, as I said, since 2016. And uh, the, um, the people that convene to produce this every month include all the major food security organizations of the world. And again, they bring information in, but they're also clients for it. And the, the real power of it is it's uh, uh, the fact that it's uh, a consensus product. 
So when we look at all the crop monitoring we're doing together, we see this map and uh, now the areas in gray are areas not covered at this point by crop monitors, but you can see the vast majority of the world is covered either by the Amos uh, crop monitor or the early warning, or in some cases, both. And I'll talk a bit about some of these darker orange colors where they actually, they're actually uh, places where there's regional and national level monitors. And these are examples of some of the crop monitoring bulletins coming out of uh, three of the countries in Africa. There's uh, quite a number more. What we found was uh, with the global crop monitor for early warning, when we could actually work with the countries and co-develop uh, crop monitors within those countries so that the countries actually operate own that system, they automatically trust the information they're producing much better. And that trust allows them to move that information through to decisions on policies and programs very quickly. And if you're dealing with emerging food security emergencies, that speed of transfer of science through to the decision maker is critical. And things like drought and so on, where decisions have to be made in an early warning sense as soon as possible to have a real impact on the ground. What we found by working in this co-development way in many ways, these national monitors are we've, where we've had the greatest impact on uh, uh, people's lives, uh, uh, people not starving to death, uh, and general well-being of the populations. And we continue to move forward in this front. Now, back in 2017, uh, we heard from the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And they indicated these crop monitors are great. They, they were using them in their food uh, security advisories, but they said in emerging hotspots, once a month just was not enough. So um, in response to that request, uh, GeoGlam developed uh, special reports on an ad hoc basis in these emerging hotspots bringing together information from things like the JRC's ASAP program, Anomaly Hotspots, um, the harvest activities and, and other activities around the world, bringing better and higher resolution information and speaking more in more detail, more specifically about these, uh, these issues. And we found them to be quite useful and our clients have found them quite useful. And then there's things like the uh, uh, GeoGlam and the COVID-19 uh, response that uh, we published in a blog in uh, May, things like this. So we continue to evolve and considering our original mandate from the G20 was to focus on uh, markets. They evolved and we evolved to have more of a food security focus. And certainly in, in recent years, now we see that the big three priorities, as I call them, have arisen uh, climate SDGs, as well as disaster uh, response. And these are requiring more, quanti more, more quantitative information than what we've been producing in the past. So once again, our community is seeing ourselves in a position where we need to evolve our work to be able to address these new and growing policy challenges. And for the components into that, and I'll talk a bit, bit about these as I go towards my wrap up, is the essential agricultural variables, which is going to drive everything. This is uh, defining the essential information required to meet these various needs. Uh, the research and development, which uh, responds to those needs and provides some of the eventually operational solutions. Also, we're looking at data and computing infrastructure and knowledge management to deliver this in an open and, uh, and easily accessible way to a broad community rate right from less developed countries to developed countries. So in terms of uh, why we're doing this, I like this diagram because it really just shows the complexity of the, the policy landscape we're in. It's from the European Observatory of Earth Observation Networks. And we just highlighted a few of the GeoGlam, GeoLinks, but if you look in behind, you see the SDGs and you see other policy drivers as well as a number of information sources. And this is only a, when we take into consideration the EAVs that we're developing, the number of connections, not just within the food security related SDGs, but across the whole 
range of almost all SDGs would be overwhelming. The complexity is very difficult. And when you consider to address any one of these issues, is not the information generally isn't going to come from one place. It's going to require an integration across communities and across science domains. So how do we as a community deal with this? That's where we decided that the essential agricultural variables was the best way forward to really uh, span the continuum of data and observations up to the decision maker and providing that quantitative information that's required. So as the essential variables, the concept is simple. It's very, it's totally consistent with the essential climate variables who kind of pioneered this work and now we have bio, biodiversity uh, variables and so on. And so different communities are latching onto this concept. What I really suggest is a minimum set of fundamental variables required to characterize state and change in a system. And uh, I like to say that uh, when you look at an ecosystem or an agricultural ecosystem, there's really only so many ways to slice and dice that ecosystem. And this, <coughs> excuse me, this approach allows us to identify the key variables that we can pursue, makes a, the, the activity much more manageable. And then the EAVs allow us to reduce the complexity and look at how we meet multiple needs by communicating our outputs in terms of these variables to a broader community and assuming other people adopt similar language around essential variables it uh, should foster a better way to integrate and coordinate our information across the science domains and some of the high level essential variables are you know bread and butter things like crop masking uh, crop type crop area crop condition and yield these are the high level ones but they're based on a kind of a foundation of a number of other essential variables and attributes not just mapping the hierarchy there just shows you the uh, a draft mapping hierarchy and then some of the variables that populate those uh, map mapping units as well so this is very much a work in progress and this shows you some of the timeline we had intended to be finished around now, but with the uh, pandemic, of course, that slowed everything down, but we're still doing quite well. And I think we're looking at uh, a delivery um, in probably into uh, early next year sometime. The important thing to point out though, is the products. We'll be producing a database on these essential variables. We'll be doing a gap analysis. What do we have that meets the requirements now? What are missing? And then using this to drive uh, also the research agenda. I'll talk a bit more about that. I will be doing uh, peer review publications around this, uh, developing a website, and as I said, uh, revisiting our research agenda to come up to, to uh, come up with a version two. And then I'll be talking about the, the GeoGlam portal and the knowledge hub bit, but uh, really we see that playing a critical role in brokering a lot of this information and also uh, linking eventually through to using this uh, EAV approach to develop standards, best practices, tools, and data. And again, I'm linking back to the, the knowledge portal or the knowledge hub, which will help to broker and make all this information, all these tools um, more accessible. So in terms of research and development, uh, kind of our foundation uh, uh, for the research has been, uh, a lot of it's been based on the Joint Experiments for Crop Assessment and Monitoring, JCAM Network. Uh, we're now, I think we're about 50 sites or so around the globe. Um, we've also developed a, a research agenda version one, which predated the uh, essential variables. So we're really looking forward to getting this work done so that we can go back to that research agenda and use it to prioritize some of the work we've identified. And we see this as being a very important document for groups, funding groups, and supporting groups like the European Space Agency, who, who actually support a lot of the work that uh, will is and will help us drive towards these essential variables, and uh, should be a great resource for them, as well as the researchers in the broader science community to identify what uh, the key pieces of key gaps that are missing uh, where we need to invest in additional research and so on. Okay, so another part of this is data and computing infrastructure, making sure there's access for all. Now, our community has adopted a federated approach to uh, information technology. 
Uh, we believe in platform independence. And by federated approach, I mean one size does not fit all. We need multiple places to go. This morning, I was giving a talk at Next Geos uh, Symposium, who are developing some of that, inf one example of the infrastructure. Um, so that's why this slide uh, shows that. But uh, it really, uh, this approach will help to identify opportunities. We want to break down barriers for our community, again, from less developed nations up through to the more developed nations, to break down the barriers to being able to do this work by providing access to data and com computational services that will get the job done. We're looking at in situ data coordination now as well, and that's something for the future um as we move forward and also open public good infrastructure access and it's important to state that there really is no good sustainable source for public good infrastructure access yet there's examples and pilots but uh, we in order to help the less developed nations of the world move forward in a quick way in developing cloud processing and so on these solutions that can really have big impact we really need to invest in in open uh, public good resources. And we see many opportunities already out there. The next GEOS pilot, as I mentioned, uh, the E-SHAPE uh, GeoGlam, GeoGlam pilot is underway. And th these are just from Europe. I haven't talked about the, the Har NASA Harvest GAM, the China Crop Watch, and all these other ones. And I, I'm here at the ESA meeting, so I have to mention the uh, food security tech. We've recently been talking to them about uh, the uh, Send to Agri and seen that as another possible resource uh, for the community to use. And um, Sophie, who's online, she was instrumental in helping us develop uh, an Amazon based Send to Agri click and run system. Basically, again, breaking down the barriers, allowing people to access the applications. Um, in a very democratic way, not having to have all the background understanding of, of how the cloud processing works. Um, so moving forward to talk a little bit about knowledge management, how do we bring all these pieces together and make them open, accessible and reproducible? And uh, over the last year, um, we worked with the, that uh, Amazon Send to Agri as part of a geo pilot to pilot the development of a knowledge hub that went quite well and this year they're in the implementation stages so now we're looking at developing a geoglam portal on the geo knowledge hub i am time is up so hurry up please okay this is my last slide so uh, the knowledge management the portal is on the geo knowledge hub we're just starting to build it it'll have knowledge packages based on and referring to the essential agricultural variables and really we see geogram providing a gateway to everything from the peer-reviewed science in this portal right through to the uh, cloud-based solutions so and all all the things between when you think of the of the uh, discovery research to the operational continuum and that's it thank you very much and i'll unshare okay so thank you ayan so we we I don't see any question ar arising. Uh, maybe I have one. Is about uh, I mean you you spoke about uh, in situ data coordination. So can you give more words about it? I just wrote a draft uh, discussion paper for our community to uh, to uh, consider this fall. But I've had a lot of discussions within the GeoGlam community. When you look at computing infrastructure. You look at the algorithm development and all aspects of work, it's all beginning to be there, the cloud processing and so on. We're quickly approaching a point where one of the last big barriers to total democratization access to this technology is the, the ability to um, find good in situ data collected on the ground that meets the need. And we know that a lot of people are in projects that collect data. They have, they often have intentions or requirements in their funding to share the data, but there's no real mechanisms uh, to or a coordination system to do that. There are now some infrastructures, stack infrastructures, and so on to help uh, on the infrastructure side. But we see it as a possibility as our community to actually take a, a real uh, custodial role in this 
area of in-situ data coordination so that we can start to move forward, make it available to all, especially things like machine learning and AI, providing some at least sample data sets that people can access uh, to test algorithms and also test the reproduci re reproducibility of some of the science that they're doing. Okay, thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much for that interesting presentation, Ian. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Breaking Through the Barriers to the Adoption of EO Data by Governments for the Operational Production of Official National Agricultural Statistics through International Partnership and National Ownership, a presentation that will be jointly given by Lorenzo De Simone and Sophie Bontem. Um, and this is a great next topic, I think, because that last mile of uh, moving the methods into operational use, I think, are very, very critical. Um, and so I think that uh, Sophie and um, and Lorenzo need to be made. I don't know which one of you needs to be made the uh, presenter first. Lorenzo. Lorenzo, perfect. Um, and I don't, I had assumed that Somebody else was doing that, but let me see if I can figure out how to do that. No, I can't. Bjorn, I think. Bjorn, can you help make a... Oh, perfect. He is the presenter now. Great. Lorenzo, you're good to go. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lorenzo De Simone, and I will talk about the uh, EOSTAT project jointly with uh, Sophie Bontemps from uh, UCL, and I will just share my screen now. Okay, so um, I will briefly describe the EOSTAT project, which has been funded by FAO. And I would like to describe how FAO and its international partners are dealing with the barriers that hamper the adoption of earth observation data for the production of official agricultural statistics and give some examples of, uh, uh, of the pilots that we are implementing. Uh, very rapidly, the, the structure of the presentation is based on the uh, highlighting importance of agricultural statistics, showing which are the advantages of, of the use of the earth observation data which are the most commonly found barriers to the adoption of Earth observation data in the national statistical offices, provide the description of the EOSTAT solution and its two main components, the UN Global Platform and the Send to Agri Toolbox, uh, give an update of the project status, and then also uh, introduce the Send for Start project, the Sentinel for Agricultural Statistics. So uh, I'm sure everybody knows, but it's always good to, to uh, uh, repeat those uh, important points. So the crop mapping on a seasonal basis, it can provide improved estimates of near real-time changes in crop production and hence can greatly benefit strategic planning in agroecological systems. The knowledge of the spatial and the temporal dynamics in the crop growth and crop type distribution is crucial in many applications related to land management, for example, Food security, yield forecast, prediction of commodity prices. Um, I would like to change the slide, but okay. So uh, advantages of the use of earth observation data uh, for the generation of crop statistics. So there are a series of, of advantages. First of all, the cost efficiency side. So the data are for free, the data is extensive, so it covers very large uh, geographic extents. It allows for production of statistics that are very granular, so the disaggregation uh, can reach sub-district level, as opposed to the traditional methods. The timeliness is quite satisfactory because it allows for forecasting and also for providing seasonal estimates, so during the season. Uh, it can be implemented with a high frequency and it allows for the optimal sample size and segment size uh, design. Okay, so the most commonly found barriers out of our experiences, of course there are many, 
But those ones are probably the four, let's say, uh, most relevant ones. First of all, it's difficult to integrate Earth observation data workflows within existing workflows in the, in the, in the national uh, statistical offices. So there is a need for a coordinated approach to this type of change. Um, secondly, uh, uh, the exquisite nature of the Earth observation data uh, requires uh, uh, specific data acquisition and pre-processing techniques. And those are already you know, uh, uh, an important burden for the end user. Thirdly, data computing, uh, uh, data management and computing infrastructures, that's still not so uh, uh, easy to access. Although there are now many options out there, this is still a challenge because it requires specific knowledge. And, and finally, the way to interact with the modern data cube model uh, uh, often requires specific uh, uh, coding skills, which again constitute a barrier. Okay, so what is the EOSTAT solution then? How do we approach the problem? So uh, uh, just a review of the scope. The scope is to build the capacity in the use of the Earth observation data to produce official agricultural statistics. Uh, we are implementing two pilots for the time being, one in Senegal and one in, in Uganda. And of course, the project also prepares the floor for the following uh, implementation of the Send for Start project funded by ESA, the European Space Agency. So through the establishment of, of international partnership, essentially with the University Catholic de Louvain uh, and with the UN Big Data Group, so uh, and, and thanks to a dedicated uh, program, training program, this is the way we, we, we are looking forward to uh, break through those barriers. So first of all, the, 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 the solution, the sanctuary solution will allow for uh, uh, a full package for the pre-processing and analysis of Earth observation images through uh, a graphic user interface. Secondly, the UN Global Platform allows for a low cost and easy uh, to deploy solution for the Send to Agri toolbox in the cloud. The specific training programs will focus on actually best practices for georeferencing crop data in the field, training on the deployment of the Send to Agri, and training in the use of the Send to Agri. Of course, the key for country ownership is the, the process of co creation. So they really want to be able, by the end of the project, to have all the tools and the, con uh, the knowledge, basically, to be able to be independent and to repeat this in time. And finally, also uh, 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 an important aspect, of course, is the ground truth data, as it was also highlighted in the previous presentation. This is a, a scarce resource. So FAO, through the ABIS program, which is linked to the 50 by 2030 program, is basically supporting these projects by providing an extensive uh, data collection uh, activity. A last note, of course, COVID was also mentioned. COVID is impacting all the projects, all the activities in the field. So we have to find a customized protocol for the two countries. So for the case of Senegal, we decided to use data from previous uh, agricultural survey. Whereas for Uganda, we limited the geographic scope of the project just in those areas where basically it is possible to, to carry out the survey. So we are having a specific field survey campaign being implemented as, as we speak. So just to wrap up, how is the, the landscape of the project? So the actors, we have the stakeholders in the two respective countries. So in Senegal, it's the Ministry of Agriculture because they are in charge of the official agricultural statistics. Whereas in Uganda, we have the Uganda Bureau of Statistics. The implementers are FAO and UC Louvain. The input data they go into the project are, of course, Sentinel-2 data, as well as Landsat-8, it can be used. And the inside in situ data coming from the Agris. The technology stack is, is as, as we mentioned, is the Sent to Agri toolbox, deployed within the UN Global Platform, provided by the UN Group on Big Data. So as a result of, of, of this synergy, we expect to, uh, uh, to produce the national agricultural statistics. 
I'm trying to switch slide. Okay, just a small introduction to the UN Global Platform. Uh, so it's a collaboration network for innovative research projects that benefit the official statistics community. Its members are comfortable with software and engineering and aim to leverage this to build solutions for the statistical community. It uses an innovation pipeline approach to grow ideas from proofs of concept to reliable and scalable global services. Specifically for EOSTAT, the UNGP is building an infrastructure as code that allows the send to agri to be deployed with minimal effort according to best practices in security and a very low production and operating costs. Uh, so as a result, this aims to lower barriers to the use of send to agri and to assist in scaling up production of crop maps globally. This is just a, a, a diagram, but uh, we can leave details you say, for questions if, if required. Two words on the send to agri. So, uh, uh, as, as many of, of, uh, of us already know, the send to agri constitutes a unique open source system, uh, which has already been demonstrated at full scale for near real time or offline running locally or in the cloud. Uh, the toolbox has been released in, in its latest version in March 2020. It allows for the production of monthly cloud-free surface reflectance composites at 10 and 20 meters, cropland masks at 10 meters updated every month as of the beginning of the, uh, the crop season, crop type maps at 10 meters for the main regional crops, and finally, it allows to the, pro the production of vegetation status maps at 10 meters delivered every week. Of course, the, 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 the main advantages of Saint Wiley to break through the, the adoption barriers is basically uh, a few points which are key. Uh, it allows for the uh, um, downloading and pre-processing of, cloud of uh, uh, Earth observation uh, images in an effortless way. Uh, it allows basically uh, to uh, access the, 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 the functions through a user, uh, graphic user interface. It's free and open source under GPL licenses. And of course, its outputs are at 10 meters resolution, which then allow for really for the monitoring at the crop level, at the plot level. And of course, for countries, for example, like Africa, where you have small plots, it's very important, this, this information, because 10 meters is, is, is very uh, suitable for most of the countries. Um, the system, of course, is, is not experimental anymore. It's already been tested uh, and it's been already demonstrated. So we have examples from uh, Mali. Uh, in 2016, uh, the crop mask and crop type map was produced with very high accuracy, as you can see. Furthermore, in Ukraine as well, and South Africa, where it also allowed for the monitoring of the uh, phenological phases and finally the production of the, of the crop type map. So, EOSTAT projects say, so where we stand with the projects in the two countries. So in Senegal, uh, we've managed already to establish the, the country project and to have the national uh, focal point nominated in the agricultural, uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture. The system has already been deployed within the UN Global Platform, and the first training has been delivered in June 2020 on how to deploy Sent to Agri. So that's the first training. And ground, ground truth data has already been shared by the DAPSA. Next steps we're looking at between October and December is the elaboration of the crop masks and the crop maps. The workshop will be organized with this, uh, uh, in order to deliver the, 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 the training on the actual same to agri. So we're going to recreate the crop masks and the crop maps with the national counterpart. And finally, the presentation of the final results. And we hope also for some publications next year. In Uganda, the situation is, uh, is uh, a bit more complicated. So we managed to form the national project team and, uh, uh, and the focal point was nominated in Idubos. Um, and for the time being, a smart sampling design has been finalized for the ad hoc survey. 
So now we are trying to push in the last three months of time to basically implement this dedicated survey and the training on how to uh, optimally georeference the data. Uh, and then we will have to deploy the, the, the toolbox on the UN Global Platform and uh, uh, subsequently the work to elaborate the crop masks and the crop maps. And then a final workshop will be provided for the Send to Agri hands-on training and the presentation of final results. And at, at this point... Sorry, I Lorenzo, we, um, Sophie has noted that she needs five minutes to pr pr uh, complete her presentation and um, okay. there are only two or three minutes remaining in the slot. Okay, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Alisa. So um, I will introduce you the Send for Stat project briefly. Uh, you have understood that the uh, activities uh, presented by FAO is closely related to this uh, project, so Sentinel for Agricultural Statistics, uh, which is funded by ESA. So the objective of this project is to demonstrate the benefit of EO information for agricultural statistics by engaging with uh, the national statistical offices and by making this demonstration within the operational workflow. So we will really work through concrete activities to show how EO data can be used. And I think that this is really related with the barriers that were presented before by Lorenzo. So at the end of this project, which uh, will last three years, the objective is to have um, demonstrated and validated algorithm uh, and tools, uh, best practices that we can share with the NSOs or with any uh, users interested okay. in the topic. You can see uh, how the, uh, the project is organized here. And so I'm not detailed, but so what is important to know is that we are working uh, with five uh, pilot countries so Spain, Senegal, Malawi, Tanzania, and Ecuador, that uh, we are interacting with a steering committee uh, made by international bodies. And so we will uh, work on the cloud to see how we can combine Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 data with uh, in situ data to improve the uh, agricultural statistic. So during the first months of the project, we interacted uh, a lot with uh, the countries to see uh, which activity uh, would benefit more of the uh, EO data. And so this is what we call the use cases, and we identified six main ones. So the first one is to um, improve the cost efficiency. So statistic uh, estimates uh, need to be as accurate as possible. This is logical, and uh, traditionally this is done by using uh, ground data. And so this ground data as a cost, and so getting the accuracy is always a balance between the accuracy of the, of the estimates and the cost uh, of the data. By adding EO data, we expect that we can increase the accuracy of the estimates, but we also need to take care uh, to uh, not increase too much the cost. And so the cost is not only the economical cost, of course, Sentinel is for free, but there is also the cost uh, in terms of um, operational uh, aspects, so the, the methodologies and so on. The second uh, main um, use case is um, about the uh, spatial disaggregation uh, of uh, the statistics, so the granularity. So the current sampling are often designed to have such statistics at the national level. And if you want to compute these statistics over smaller administrative areas, you do not have enough samples. And here, EO data can clearly uh, uh, help. The third one is the timeliness of the statistics, which are often available late after the end of the year, uh, and also only once a year. And here again, uh, we would like to see how EO data can uh, provide forecasts of the statistics, so during the season, and uh, can also increase uh, the, rap the, 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 the time uh, the rapidity uh, of the publication of the statistics. Uh, um, last one could be to provide seasonal estimates instead of only uh, annual ones. Then we have an application for the sampling design to use the EU data to support the building of an area sampling frame and also the SDGs reporting to see how we can uh, contribute to some indicators related to the SDGs 2 and 6 about zero hunger and uh, the water management. And the last one is the data collection protocol. So um, 
Statistics Estimate relies on a strong assumption that the ground data is of high quality, meaning unbiased and reliable. If you have already done a field campaign or work with data coming from a field campaign, you know that this is a very strong assumption. And here again, we would like to see how EO data can uh, contribute to reducing the uncertainty associated to this ground data. This is for the use cases. In terms of EO products, I will uh, not read the list because I think that we are uh, already uh, late in the timing, but we have identified different EO products that can support the use cases. And uh, what we are doing now, we are in the phase of a benchmarking. So we have received data from uh, the pilot countries at national scale, and we are uh, combining these data with Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 to find for each use case what are the products that are the most efficient and uh, to identify the best methodologies. And on this basis, we are uh, designing a, a central stat system or toolbox. The main constraint of this toolbox uh, is that it needs to be open source, also very flexible and modular because we know that there is no one solution that will fit for all. Um, and also a very uh, specific attention for the privacy and security because you know we know that uh, all the uh, raw data related to agriculture are very very sensitive and so this is where we are now in 2021 2020 to 22 we will demonstrate what we have developed uh, here this year at national scale in the in the pilot countries thank, thank, you. thank you sophie i'm we have we're a little over time and i know we'll have time to discuss at the very end do you have one sort of very concluding remark to give and then we can move forward sure okay Perfect. Um, I guess I'll pass it over back to Marie now to uh, introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much, Sophie and Lorenzo. Sorry that we were a little tight on time. Marie, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. I'm so sorry. So I just want to introduce uh, Sergi Skakun uh, from the University of Maryland, and uh, he will present the NASA Avest um, uh, program. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Marie, and um, thank you everybody for inviting me. And uh, my name is Sergi Skakun from University of Maryland, and I'm, I'm going to give you an update on the NASA harvest activity. So now I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Right. Okay, so um, I, I try to do my best in these 15 minutes because uh, there are a lot of success stories within Harvest. All right, so. Okay, so Harvest was launched around three years ago and uh, it's a, a, a NASA funded uh, consortium. So the uniqueness of this consortium is it's being run um, outside NASA by University of Maryland to give flexibility in multiple activities. And the real objective of this um, project and, and initiative is to get best, best use of different Earth observation data products and infrastructure to tackle the problem of food security and agricultural monitoring. So uh, another uniqueness is that we pretty much um, are focused and driven by user needs and uh, those uh, sort of needs uh, are being implemented through uh, around 30 different activities and projects uh, that have both fundamental results in remote sensing and in observation, but also with a lot of application uh, uh, side of that. Um, uh, those activities have been uh, run by more uh, over 50 uh, different partners, and they spread different thematic areas, food security, early warning, uh, how the inform, uh, information from the uh, satellites can help with reducing uncertainties to the agricultural markets, yield assessment and forecasting with crop type mapping in area estimations, which obviously are important parameters to estimate and predict the uh, crop production. And uh, the activities are ranging from both domestic in US, but also throughout multiple uh, continents and countries that are important in terms of the agricultural. Uh, monitoring. And a lot of those activities are done through the collaboration within GeoGlam, and, and this project is a NASA contribution to GeoGlam, and, but also it allows to build new um, partnerships. 
So uh, I'll start with the uh, how uh, harvest works in terms of uh, agricultural mar markets, and uh, I am early in the morning today already mentioned about the contribution of GeoGlam in terms of agriculture monitoring si market system, information system, sorry. So, in, and the really idea is to uh, reduce the uncertainties in terms of forecasting crop production. So, this is on the left example of uh, Joseph Glauber of this spaghetti of uncertainties depending how far it is in the before the harvest and how they converge from multiple years and this is the opportunity for remote sensing because obviously there is a strong correlation between the uh the, the for, uh, for, forecast of production and the uh, market value uh, of the of the crops so in order to do that uh, we have a range of activities related to the popular forecasting and assessment that range really from the field scale to subnational scale national scale and global scale Depending on the requirements and, uh, and and the scale, we use different data and different methods. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, the level of uncertainty is it ranges if we're talking about global scale, three five percent, and field scale. Uh, this is where the uh, uncertainty is is larger. But the idea is to produce uh, in season uh, one to uh, three months uh, before harvest. Uh, to know the uh, potential yields uh, in in, uh, in important countries, so uh, crop monitor have been uh, uh, has been a, a great success story. Again, that I, I mentioned about that, and uh, the, the the real um, why it was possible to to make it successful is because of great collaboration of different uh, partners. More than forty partners contribute to that, and this is a consensus. A view on the current conditions that can also feed to the AMIS uh, system. Uh, so far, we've published more than 120 bulletins, and this is uh, this work is really operational, and it's been features in in multiple news uh, outlets, uh, uh, and for example, including the latest one on the North Korea. So, because of that success of global uh, crop monitoring. Uh, system, uh, we've been asked to, uh, to to design and implement system based on the uh, for regional scale. And this is the example of Eastern Africa. Uh, obviously, there are some peculiarities in terms of user requirements, uh, but uh, basically, this is the same approach, the same design uh, of the system to target regional uh, peculiarities. So, in, in this in this regard, one of the most important things was to build the trust. Uh, and and the idea of what you can get from and how to interpret it and how you can get the knowledge from the earth observation data and products and how that can be implemented in the existing decision making system. Obviously, to do that, a lot of training uh, has been done, and with the idea also that the uh, eventually users will take the ownership of the of the system. So this is this, the system will be run. Uh, on their premises by them, and they will be the owners of that information and system. And this is just one of the um, several examples of, of Uganda. This is the work that was done by Catherine Nakalembe, which just recently won Africa Food Prize Award, the very prestigious uh, award that they, she did uh, with other collaborators in Uganda in order to provide a very early in the season the information about the potential crop losses and the this is the quote from the <clears throat> office of the prime minister of uganda about the uh, benefits of satellite data that allow them to act proactively and save uh, a lot of resources and and a lot of people have been helped and assisted so going down uh, the sort of the scale re uh, global regional and country level in terms of Crop monitor. So this is the examples of system being implemented with Kenya, Malawi, Tanzania, and Vietnam. Uh, and again, uh, the, the those systems have been uh, implemented on, on user premises, uh, and they've been run by there with some uh, our support. Uh, so moving from the crop yield uh, and status assessment to the crop area and uh, estimation and mapping. So this is the. Uh, our long-standing collaboration with uh, Buenos Aires Grain Exchange, uh, where we use different satellite data to map uh, uh, winter wheat in, uh, and soybean and 
and maize in Argentina using various data, including Moody's and Lancet data and Sentinel-2, and, and see, for example, how the crop rotation impact the, the potential productivity for addressing the sustainability. Uh, this is the work from Matt Hansen and Glad Group. Uh, so basically, they uh, operationalized the methods uh, which combines uh, satellite data that they use for certification and then error frame sample to crop area estimation. They've been doing this for several years uh, for soybean, uh, and uh, this is for Americas, including uh, US, Brazil, Argentina, and other major producing countries uh, in, in that regions. And, uh, um, and the, the main uh, feature is that, uh, especially particular for soybean and maize, that you really have to go into the fields. You, you cannot do this uh, uh, from the office uh, just for the job team because of the basically each year is sort of uh, unique um, and uh, and also the, obviously because of different shifting uh, cultivations areas that have been monitored and uh, been addressed in the South uh, America. So this is how those estimates uh, compared to USDA uh, uh, data. And the most important thing that they can do this uh, in season. Uh, the same approach with soybean is being implemented in China for maize. So this is the uh, still ongoing work. Uh, and uh, here to address the uncertainties related to the China uh, crop production and different revisions. Uh, obviously, in this year, the, this work was uh, obviously affected by the COVID, but uh, hopefully we'll uh, report on the results very soon. And again, the same problem with COVID when there were uncertainties related to the winter, winter wheat, winter crops in, in Russia, uh, this work that I've been involved, uh, and we tried to use satellite data. And here we, we did use photo interpretation, but with a lot of information, uh, in, in tr reading a lot of information on the local status, because here, uh, like in Russia and here in this region in Ukraine, the main uncertainty is related to the how to, dis in terms of mapping and discrimination, how to discriminate the, the early, uh, early season crops. Uh, so, uh, however, we've been able to do some estimates, including the uncertainties, and they're pretty much in the line with the uh, USDA numbers. So, uh, another very important component that's been addressed in the harvest is rapid response. So, basically, when uh, we've been tasked uh, to do uh, uh, something very quickly, and by something very quickly, I mean uh, around one week, 10 days, uh, and this is the example of uh, of Togo. So, because of the strict uh, lockdowns, there were really uh, very little of the human mobility. So, and it impacted the uh, agriculture in that re in that country. So, uh, the authorities they wanted to know uh, real information in terms of uh, of farmers and where the land being cultivated, so they can get. Uh, uh, response and assistance to those. So we've been using uh, Sentinel to data at two meter, uh, sorry, at ten meter special resolution, but also used Planet Data Sky Set for collecting ground truth uh, data, and we've been able to do that. So our team was able to do that in ten days, and uh, that, that was a big deal for for authorities. Another example, so which probably most of you heard about, the ranch in Iowa, in Midwest uh, U.S. So we use SAR data to uh, to get information on the uh, where the crops were were damaged, and yeah, we, we used uh, HLS data, harmonized Lancet eight and Sentinel two project to map in season the soybean and corn and see which uh, are the areas to estimate the areas that were impacted by this uh, disaster, and. Uh, sort of last but not least, a uh, uh, public-private partnership uh, with the idea is to how both sides can benefit. So, in terms of what are the requirements from the end users, in, which in this case would be private industry, but also they want to know what are the state-of-the-art um, um, techniques and methods that have been used so they can so they can benefit. And, but also uh, another thing that I see uh, important is just to to make the trust and make sure that um, methods and, and capabilities of remote sensing are not being oversold and uh, uh, the, the, the weaknesses and some of the limitations and also strengths of those methods have been understood by both parties in terms of both uh, scientists, researchers, practitioners, 
practitioners and end users and farmers. Um, so yeah, and uh, there was a correspondent paper uh, by Sylvain Couture from Swiss Rainbow, Alisa and Chris Justice from the uh, Harvest uh, in, in Nature about the um, ideas and, and some of the benefits of this uh, private uh, public-private partnership. So this is just to show the example of the uh, uh, of one of the case studies in, in collaboration with Swiss Re in, in Ukraine in terms of collecting cuts to estimate the um, to estimate crop yields during the season and uh, different optimizations uh, you know, that uh, allows to reduce the number of samples and to optimize the routes and to, to optimize the um, the cuts on the uh, on the yields. Okay, this is some summary and uh, key takeaways. Uh, I don't know how much time. Um, yeah, I think I'm right on the time, so I won't read it. Um, this is uh, our UMD University of Maryland hub uh, partnership. So this work is really the collaborative efforts by multiple uh, multiple persons uh, that are led by Inbo, uh, Becker Russia, Felisa Woodcraft, and, and Chris Justice and many, many other partners. So uh, I'll stop here and uh, take any questions if there are uh, any. So is a, there is no question on the slide also. You, maybe you can, you can comment on the last slide. Yes, so, um, yeah, so just uh, summary. So, uh, so again, uh, NASA Harvest has been three years and there have been a lot of success uh, stories and obviously we adjust to the new uh, capabilities in terms of uh, availability of remote sensing satellite computer resources uh, and, and methods um, uh, as i mentioned before it's really important to not oversell but to show real capabilities strengths and weaknesses and uh, again it's critical to understand capabilities and limitations and that that's been transferred also to the industry and to the, and to the farmers. And uh, um, the uh, sort of innovations in science and technology has been driven by the user requirements. So this is something that we want to implement and really to make it as a partnership across different countries, organizations and sectors. So um, yeah, so uh, I'll stop here. Um, uh, I have much more backup slides, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, don't, so we don't have any questions in the in the chat, and I feel a bit silly since obviously it's like the call is coming from inside the house if I ask a question. But I'd love to ask you a question, Sergei, with the two minutes or so that we have left with you. Of course, because, you know, there's lots of data out there, and we've we've seen the demonstration of a lot of different methods. Um, but there are not a lot of products available at scale. And I think I think this is a question that we might take up in the discussion that we have 20 minutes for discussion at the end. But I'm curious to hear with your time, you know, what, what you think the real barriers are there to, to creating products at scale and how we might get there. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a great question. And it's, um, it's still uh, a lot of de debates going. Uh, obviously, we see a lot of uh, maps available and some of the regional maps avail available and being generated with GE, um, uh, Google Earth Engine. Uh, I, I think um, I think the most important thing is the is the quality of those data and uh, uh, and this should be uh, and there are some of the mechanism uh, established with CS Calval obviously. Uh, but I think uh, sometimes people not aware of that, and this has been like just my personal experience from reviewing papers or, or even proposals. And uh, that is sort of uh, downplays uh, the downplays the, the 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 quality of the product. So I think the the quality is is the most important thing, and also the investment into the uh, in situ data. Uh, that's another big deal because we don't have any centralized system. Even even we're trying to do that through the harvest, right? Uh, to have, but because of the also the private privacy issues, some of the data cannot be shared, and that obviously influences the potential of being validating some products. And some of the products is just difficult to do. Like for example, if you wanna 
map like um, even even we don't have like yearly very good global scale cropland i'm not talking even some soybean or uh, or particular crops uh, um, uh, because it's very difficult to do and uh, there are some initiatives like uh, World uh, of Surveillance Project and Matt Hansen group is doing, and uh, we've been doing this, trying to get, uh, to do some global project products on the wheat, for example. Uh, but it's just uh, each country can be very specific. Uh, so that is the I think Thank some obstacles on that. And I think there, there is a question. Uh, let me see. There is a question from the there, chat. There are a couple of questions coming in, but we're coming right up to the edge of the time. Um, why don't we do just one of them? Um, yeah. How was the yield data estimate used uh, by insurance adjusters in Ukraine? So it, it was so about the so the question about how yield data were estimated from the in Ukraine. So it, it was done by um, basically through the cuts. So when the people go to the field. They, they go to the uh, field, try to do a little bit of sampling, trying to capture the uh, inside variability. And basically, they do cuts and then count in the grains, talking to farmers. Uh, and yeah, this is, uh, this is how it's been done. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sergey, and I hope we'll stay help for the chat later on. I think we can address yep. some of the other questions and big picture questions then. Yep, and sure. The next presentation is from Sitka Mitzal called Ypsilon Yield Prediction by Satellite, which is a European-wide information system for agribusiness and commodity traders using high-resolution simulations. So more on yield, which I'm looking forward to. Thank you, Silke. Thank you, Alyssa. Let me just start sharing my screen. So, wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much uh, for inviting me today. Um, I think I'm going to bring in a little bit of a more commercial perspective here um, to the yield prediction and I want to tell you about our Epsilon service, which, um, as was already said, is a European-wide information service um, for agribusiness and commodity traders that we just um, really rolled out European-wide this year. Um, we is on the one hand Vista, uh, Remote Sensing and Geosciences, that's the company I work for, and Cefetra, um, which are our partners from Netherlands, and we developed the services together. Vista is, um, if you don't know us, a company that's specialized in remote sensing and land surface modeling. Um, we've been around for a while. We've been founded in 1995. We are located in Munich, and our focus is on agriculture and hydrology where in the agricultural business our services span from decision support for site-specific farming so smart farming really um, services for the farmers to these large-scale services like epsilon that i'm telling you about today um, we are 31 employees at the moment six of which have phds and um, since 2017 we belong to the biva group biva is a german agricultural company so Epsilon. What is Epsilon? What is the idea behind Epsilon? And I want to start you off here with a comparison. Um, most of you probably know what numerical weather predictions are. Numerical weather predictions use physical modeling. They assimilate satellite images into the models and they parameterize their models with back tests so that they can deliver state-of-the-art meteorological forecasts. Epsilon is in a way very similar because we use physical modeling. So we're not using statistical models, we use physical models to, to model the land surface processes. We assimilate satellite images into that, and we have parameterized our models with back tests so that we can deliver state-of-the-art yield forecast for large areas um, six weeks in advance of harvest. How does that go in a little bit more detail? Our core components are, of course, our physiological model, our crop growth model. Um, that model is ProMate, and if you have been around yesterday and, and listened to that session, um, you've heard a little bit about it already. Viva uh, virtual water values. Um, so that is the crop growth model. It's driven by, um, by meteorological information. 
Uh, uh, component is the satellite data. Here we use optical satellite images from Sentinel-2, which we process So what we do with them is first we have an atmospheric correction that's based on Motron. Then we have um, then then we mask. For different applications. So maybe we just need a relatively coarse, um, a relatively coarse. Um, um, excuse me, Silka, we're we're losing your audio a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So maybe turn off your camera and see if that helps yeah. the bit. Thank you. Yeah, give me a second. So I stopped my video. Is it better? It is. It's great now. And let's hope it stays. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. This is actually not my internet connection. It's my notebook. It gets a little overheated when the camera is on too long. Um, so, as I was saying, the satellite data uh, we get directly from the dias. Um, we process it um, with our own atmospheric correction. We mask clouds and cause shadows, and then we do a land use classification that can be relatively coarse, just where's forest, where's vegetation, where's water, or it can be very detailed and give us different crop types. And once we have that, we can derive crop parameters um, from the data. Um, which we do using a radiative transfer model. It's called SLC soil leaf canopy. Um, this satellite data then um, gets integrated. Oh, come on, gets integrated into the physiological model. Um, we assimilate the plant parameters into the crop growth models to tell um, the crop growth model the current status on the field. And you can imagine that a little bit like this um, schematic view that I'm giving you here. Um, the crop growth model starts the season modeling with the meteorological input, um, but there's a lot of information. We don't know if we have a European wide service. We do not know on every field what the farmer is doing in actual management. We don't know the fertilization status. We don't, uh, this, these are all things um, that the uh, Promet model can only um, um, can only work in different scenarios, but then we have a satellite image um, at a specific point in time, and at that point in time, we can see how did the leaf area grow, um, and we can use that as a sort of focus, like a lens that focuses. And we know he, this is this is the exact um, point right now, and then we calculate on with the Promet model in um, in more scenarios, and we do this through the whole season. So that in the end, we have a very um, specific and uh, a very um, exact knowledge on how the crop grew over the year, um, which um, we can then use to predict yields um, very accurately. And I've given you here the schematic view, uh, which just shows like four satellite images. In reality, this is a an average of, of, of 20 um, or in, in areas where the weather is better, even more satellite two images um, during a season. So what is our workflow? We have the satellite images, we do crop classification, then we do a pixel selection on um, the fields of the crop type that we want to, um, to uh, estimate yield on, um, the physiological crop growth model, um, which is driven by the meteorological data and as a background has a lot of information about like soils and the terrain of the field and things like that. Um, and in the end, we get the yield estimate out of this. So if we look a little closer at how do we do this physiological growth monitoring, um, I am showing you here um, uh, the uh, simulation 
of phenology for the uh, for winter wheat for 2019. Um, the simulation um, is based on downscale mod meteorological model data, and we have a spatial resolution of 30 arc seconds, which means for your we have um, pixel sizes smaller than one square kilometer. Um, you can see, and this is going. Yeah, now we're running. You can see now on the left side how the um, phenology and then have this, um, this, this, this wave of higher phenology um, towards the, the northeast. Um, and then somewhere in July, August, then, um, on the other side, we have the satellite imagery. And here we're really processing every Sentinel-2 image over Europe, over the 19 countries that we're calculating for it, that's coming into the archive. We process them all at 10 meter resolution, and the first thing we do is the classification. Um, I show you an example here for France, where you see winter crops, spring crops, rapeseed and maize. Um, and we do our first uh, crop classification early in the season, of course, because we want to, to predict the yields. So we need to know what is on the fields early in the season. And then with every new image that comes in, um, we keep updating the crop classification so that we reach ever higher accuracies of, uh, during the season. Um, from these uh, classified crops, we then um, select samples. We select hundreds of thousands of individual pixels within these fields um, for each crop type that we want to calculate yield for. Um, and we make sure that they have a very good quality, that we're very sure that it's the crop type that we want, um, that they have a lot of satellite imagery available and not only cloudy scenes, that they're not too far, uh, too close to a field border. We, we really put a lot of, um, a lot of quality criteria in there. And then we get something like this. This is the sample distribution um, for wheat for France in 2020, um, where you can see that we're covering with our samples um, all of the major crop and areas for uh, wheat in France. Um, and we get all of these little dots for which we uh, calculate the yield forecasts. You can also already see that here in France, um, we have uh, quite um, variable yields, um, some very high, very good areas, some that are also not quite as good, um, where the yields are relatively low. Now, I told you we're doing this mostly for, um, for commodity traders and big businesses and mills, and um, these are all people that do not really want to look at hundreds of thousands of individual samples. Um, so what we do next is we aggregate this to regions and countries. So you can see in the background here the regions that we have in France as the black borders. Um, and then, of course, also um, for the whole of France. Um, now I would like to show you the, the, uh, how good we did this year, but of course I can't yet because as we've heard the statistics take a while. So while the winter wheat season is over, um, the yield statistics for wheat for Europe are not there yet. What I can show you is how good we were in the past years. Um, we did back test results um, for the EU for 2017 to 2019. Um, and here you can see uh, just a scatter plot of uh, our yield forecast uh, in comparison to the Eurostat statistics. The one on one line is painted in there. You can see it's maize, rapeseed, and wheat that is um, compared here. And you can see that for all three of them, we're uh, really close to the one on one line with our um yield forecasts but then of course the um the actual end result of the yield is only one component of the service the second part of the service and we've also heard this before today is um that it is really important when in time you know a very good yield prediction so here i'm showing you an example for wheat for germany in 2018 um where the gray line is the average market estimate what was available on the on, on the market from different sources um and you can see in the end of the season that is really similar to what ypsilon predicted um, but if you see when the average market arrived at this um, at this prediction, that was in the end of July. 
and before that they uh, had significantly higher yields predicted, while Epsilon already um, had yield decreases um, predicted two months earlier. So this is definitely an advantage of using the satellite imagery and, and, and seeing the, um, the whole crop growth in a big picture. Um, you can, if you want, of course, um, look how this um, looks like on our portal. I have um, written the um, website here for you. It's epsilon.services. There's a free demo, um, which is not from this year, but from past year. But you can look at um, your favorite country or if you're European, the country you're, you're in um, and see how the yields develop there. And I just want to show you a few results from this year and how this looks like um, on the portal. Um, so this is the end result basically for Europe 2020 for wheat. Um, the season for this is over. We're still in the middle of predicting um, yields for maize. Um, but yeah, wheat um, at the uh, wheat harvest is done basically all over Europe. Um, and you see the, the result for the different countries, but you also can see here in the graph um, how the yield prediction developed over the, uh, the season. And you can see we started somewhere in the middle of May already with predicting um, the yields, and we started somewhere at 6.5 tons per hectare or so for France. Um, and then there wasn't, in terms of tons per hectare, there were no big upsets in France. And at the end of the year, we're a little, a little lower. What you can also see is that we have higher uncertainties. That's the light blue bars here. Higher uncertainties in the beginning of the year. And of course, the closer we get to harvest, um, the lower the uncertainty gets. Additionally to the yield forecast, um, we also have a harvest pace product. So we also see um, in the model um, from the phenology, how, how far, um, how mature is everything and how is the harvest progress going. Um, I'm showing you here again the end result for wheat for um, 220s, so basically all of Europe is harvested. Um, but in France, you can see again how the harvest progress progressed um, through July and August. You can also compare it to the last three years, to 17, to 18, and to 19, so you can see um, it was a relatively average year here, um, maybe starting a little bit later with the harvest, but um, ending up around normal. Sidka, just to say that we are um, at time now. Oh, Which wonderful. Perfect, because this is my last slide. Um, and that is all I wanted to show you today. Um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, um, feel, feel free to ask them. Great. We do actually have a couple of questions. One was from Anastasia Volkova asking, what was the name of the physiological model being used? Any details you can share on how it compares to other biophysical models like APSIM? Um, I personally have no experience with APSIM, so I cannot tell you that, the, the, uh, at least not off, uh, off the top of my head. Um, the model's name is PROMED. Um, and we've developed it together with the University of Munich, and there are a lot of scientific papers about it. Um, so if you drop me an email, I can link you to the papers, and then you can um, find all the details there. Great, thank you. Another question is um, from Hervé Cadillais. Uh, in France, the big yield drop not foreseen by anybody was in 2016. Uh, if you haven't already run the model for 2016, could you? Um, yes, we could in, in theory, but the data, um, it, there's not that much data there in terms of satellite data because uh, Sentinel-2B wasn't around yet. So mm -hmm. we haven't done it so far. We've started in 2017 with our um, back tests because then the data availability was better. Okay, great. Um, another question is in terms of crop type classification. Uh, what ground info you use for that? Mm -hmm. um, we we use um, the in situ data for um, um, for validation purposes mostly, and for that we use um, whatever is available in terms of LPIS data, so the um, the cap monitoring data. Um, where if anyone is here who who is um, um, who is a part of that, it, it would be really great if they were available freely for all of Europe. 
Um, and also things like the Lucas database. Wow, the questions are just flying in. So I think we have time for one more, which is, do you have any data on how your crop classification accuracy compares to a free tool such as Send2Agri? Um, well, we we are not um, we're we're classifying basically um, or, or concentrating in our classification basically on the on the crops that we need, not on all of them. We haven't run a direct comparison to send to Agri. Um, though um, Vista is also we're uh, prime for the food security tab, and we're just integrating send to Agri or have integrated send to Agri on food security tab, so we could definitely run that comparison. Okay, excellent. There are some more questions. Um, I guess maybe since we are one minute late starting you, we can have one more, uh, which is on what information do you base your crop classification early in the season? And are you able to determine crop type before emergence? I'm not sure how you do that. So if you're no, able to we tell can... us the crop. <laughs> We, we cannot determine crop type before crop emergence. I'm sorry. Um, that that is a fear, not a thing that satellite data can do. Um, otherwise, we we basically um, we basically uh, base our uh, crop classification um, both on spectral information and on growth information, like the leaf area. So, how does the leaf area develop? Um, gives us information about the crop type. Excellent. Well, there are some more questions, but we should move on. So, Marie, please take it away. Okay, so the next speaker is Pierre Sibiri Traoré from ICRISAT, which is the International Crop Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, and he will present the orchestration platform NADIRA that, is, that aims at improving the productivity, security, and welfare of African smallholder farmers. Pierre, it's your turn. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Okay, very good. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to present about a project that's actually funded by the European Commission as an innovation action under H2020 called Nadira for um, nurturing Africa's digital revolution for agriculture. Um, Nadira was designed to um, build on a value chain um, data ecosystem uh, that has been designed by a private company called uh, Manobi Africa, called Accelerant. And uh, the objective was to um, see how we could in incorporate EO data to reduce op operational costs in smallholder agriculture. So um, the um, motivation was to see whether we could transform some of the research outcomes we have in EO into uh, robust and reliable application tools that are reproducible and repeatable and workflows and uh, develop a solution to actually combine um, a smartphone phase, uh, a smartphone based data ecosystem with um, a geospatial exploitation platform. And then to see how we could validate that over um, a few pilots in Senegal and Nigeria. So the institutions involved were Spacebell as a lead um, of the uh, Nadira project, Manobi Africa, ECRESAT, uh, the Université de Liège, uh, Viveris, uh, which is a private company dealing with IoT, uh, Swiss Re, and Eugenius Association. So the, the context of those services is really learned from um, what Accelerant is developing in smallholder agriculture. And we're really talking about contractual smallholder agriculture. Uh, Accelerant has um, uh, three main categories of services. One called AirMap, which stands for Agricultural Investment Risk Mapping and Profiling, which is um, a set of services before the start of the season to uh, for example, assess whether a farmer is likely to default on a loan based on his or her assets and his uh, historical um, practices, but also on uh, other information that are available prior to the season. The second is called BRISC, is for basis risk uh, reduction instrument and support knowledge. So this one was really about 
uh, in season monitoring of emerging anomalies uh, that may be either due to the environment and or to um, management uh, by the smallholders. And the third one is target, which is um, uh, geared towards the, um, the final produce uh, that's interested in uh, estimating the quantity of uh, farm production and also the quality of it. So this uh, background is what uh, was used for Nadira to uh, develop a set of activities, uh, which each would uh, provide products um, derived from EO into those three categories of services. If you look at um, the elicitation of the requirements of different types of users, uh, you can see uh, in a typical crop cycle that uh, people have different needs and those needs express as early as three months before the start of uh, the agricultural season, uh, if you take it as the sowing date, and um, go um, typically until after harvest when the farmers, for example, recover uh, the produce of their, um, um, uh, their investment in the form of yield. Uh, they sell it to an off-taker and that money is then used to also reimburse the bank that provided the initial loan to the smallholders. So we went through a systematic analysis for the value chains where we were working of the different needs in terms of information, inputs, uh, money, et cetera, that the different stakeholders have to, uh, to um, address. So if you look at the bottom line, Accelerant is really interested in understanding what is the size of the market and uh, how do you uh, bind it in, uh, in time and space? And then how do you uh, serve a number of EO derived products to a variety of stakeholders uh, from the bankers who provide the loan, which is absolutely necessary if you want to increase productivity uh, to access inputs, insurers who provide the financial protection for the loan uh, input suppliers, outtakers, and um, the farmers and their cooperatives. If you translate it into EO services, uh, what it meant for us was that we needed uh, to build um, um, an automated workflow that uh, harvests data from the Copernicus hub. Uh, here is the example for rice and for Sentinel-2. And whenever an image is uh, sky clear, uh, we will process it into a number of um, initial provisional products that will then be fed into Accelerant, will be qualified and validated by, uh, well, against field data, and then will lead when a parcel has reached a particular status of cropping a critical management threshold to a certain number of services. So an example for rice in the land offsetting stage is that um, as you may see at the parcel level, it is not until the parcel has reached a certain um, level of management that a banker would actually want to release a loan installment to a farmer, because if they release the loan in bulk, then they expose themselves to diversion of purpose and, um, and the farmer not reaching the intended yield objective and then defaulting on the loan reimbursement. So if you really want to use EO to de-risk operations in a commercial uh, smallholder farming system, you need to have a fairly strong way of uh, monitoring uh, deviations and management because management controls the largest uh, part of yield variability in smallholder systems. The way we built it was that uh, we interacted, we interfaced two systems, so Accelerant is what contains on the left-hand side the service module that directly interacts with the end users, but also the data three module, which is um, everything that deals with data collection on, on the field. So data collection is conducted by field agents who provide services themselves to farmers and uh, provide the data that is required for the system to operate. Then we have the geospatial exploitation platform that was uh, built by Spacebell and that fed uh, legacy data, for example, uh, um, you know, public domain weather or soil data, uh, satellite data, in that case, Sentinel-2 and 1. And then the Info-1, 2, and 3 um, information generation um, components that deal, on the one hand, for with the d detection of discrete events that are uh, linked to agronomic management, 
the monitoring of continuous processes that are the, the crop response to management and environmental triggers. And then the combination of those two into yield outcomes. These were addressed through uh, initially six products we, we aim to, uh, to look at. Uh, the extraction of parcel boundaries, of course, from very high resolution imagery. Uh, the estimation of crop type. Um, parcel preparedness in terms of the plowing and the flooding. Uh, crop conditions as they respond to management and environment. Uh, the estimation of the harvest date, which is important to determine harvest quality. And the crop yield. So you will see that, uh, for example, crop um, crop type, which is a typical EO product, is typically only valuable in a very limited set of conditions for commercial applications. Uh, the reason is because in uh, in an exploitation scenario, which I will explain in just a moment, uh, here, you typically have agents on the ground, and this corresponds to those. Uh, um, this set number three of you, you have that constellation of small parcels that are actually monitored from both the ground and space. In this case, uh, the value of knowing the crop type is close to zero because, of course, the crop is already known by the agent monitoring the field, uh, whereas it could be used potentially in a qualification when you want to estimate an addressable market. And uh, where, for example, if you see an emerging anomaly a course uh, across the course of a season, you may tell um, an input supply chain manager, oh, um, we foresee a 10% drop in the production uh, estimated at the scale of your base, and you may want to contract an additional 500 farmers to meet your, uh, your target. And in this case, you need to be able to provide that information quickly in season um, before, say, one month before harvest. So we have... Um, organize the system in such a way that it will, the JEP, the Geospatial Exploitation Platforms, will question on a five-day uh, basis uh, whenever there's a, a Sentinel-2 data pulse for the existence of a market of interest defined on accelerant, then read whether it's a new one, uh, which requires a characterization scenario, whether it is, a, it is an already existing one but without parcels on contract, which becomes a qualification scenario or whether we're dealing with an MOI that contains parcels that are on contract and therefore monitored from the ground. So different types of applications are developed and different types of behavior um, stem from those three different scenarios. We applied these in different pilots, and this um, is a snapshot of the RISE pilot that we ran in Senegal, and we, where you can see from top uh, left to bottom right, uh, the sequence of activities from land preparation, flooding, uh, the different, different stages of uh, crop growth until senescence and harvest. And the same was done for peanut, uh, where you see other peculiarities. For example, you can see uh, the issue of uh, um, plot heterogeneity, which is typical of rain-fed crops, and, uh, and likewise for, uh, for sorghum. Uh, where you see yet another problem, uh, which is the fact that in many countries, especially in Nigeria where we were focused, sorghum is typically grown as a mixed crop with um, at least another crop and often two other crops in a single field. All of the fields that we focused on were fields that were uh, typically in the order of a hectare and above, so uh, they are fairly representative of the conditions uh, that we dealt with in uh, the Senegal River Valley for rice in the central peanut basin for peanut systems in Senegal and in Bauchi and Niger states in Nigeria. So some of the products that were generated were estimates of the flooding uh, at a parcel scale. I won't get into uh, many uh, details, but uh, uh, what you can um, see is that the system actually allows us, uh, not surprisingly, to do a decent job of monitoring the actual flooding date on a per parcel basis. And uh, this we can also um, estimate based on the first inflection point on Sentinel-1 data for um, rice. This, this is feeding into Accelerant, so the two systems are seamlessly coupled, uh, meaning that any raster that estimates the extent of flooding is pushed towards Accelerant, uh, where it features alongside the, uh, the native uh, Sentinel-2 um, data, uh, RGB and cloud, the, which we also uh, display uh, to um, help arbitrate on the quality of the product. 
um, and then uh, leads to a kind of a quality assessment. So we developed uh, a set of congruence analysis and interfaces that allow us to rate the uh, reliability of the EO product vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the field data and vice versa, because very often in remote sensing, you will tend to think that the field data is the reference and is the truth. But in many cases, it is not because of a number of constraints like an agent not being able to visit the field at the time the operation is done and then having to rely on declarations from the farmers. Uh, similar um, uh, developments were made on the estimation of plowing um, uh, using change vector analysis. So this one is not based on a single image threshold, but uh, on a pair of images. Um, and um, it sort of works on rice, uh, not always on other crops. And this is an example uh, for uh, the rain fed crops uh, where uh, we have to rely again on the first inflection point to um, try and relate it to plowing events. But this is really um, still work in progress because of the complexity of the cropping systems that we are uh, dealt with in uh, rain fed. This is also fed into accelerant, so it seamlessly uh, follows. And you can see here, for example, that uh, for an, an image um, that was uh, displayed here on the 8th, uh, the 8th of March 2020 on the irrigated rice season. Um, two, the, two images later, uh, the detection was active for um, the, uh, uh, the plowing. The, of course, these data can be used to monitor phenology so, um, and extract some phenological metrics from the green up to the maximum vegeta vegetation to the onset of senescence and has been done on different pilots and then is again fed back into the accelerant platform which pushes it back to uh, the different stakeholders through different types of dashboards. So this, uh, for example, curve allows us to compare the MDVI curve uh, in green and the uh, uh, backscatter coefficient one in magenta uh, with the sowing date represented by a soil leaf and uh, the harvest date represented by those kinds of um, black dots and relate those phenological indicators to the field reported metrics. Now, of course, it becomes a problem when you um, go into systems that are a little more complex. So you see the same peanut on the top hand right and then you see uh, sorghum in Bauchi state, which is a little more uh, complex, a little moister. And then in Niger state, which is even more moist. And where you can see also the impact of uh, increased cloud cover as you go towards the moister areas on the Sentinel-2 data series and the implication on the indicators and um, the potential that S1 may actually hold for um, quantifying mixed cropping systems, as you see those kinds of uh, two and three humps in um, the individual plots. We needed to do a number of things to prepare EO for accelerant. One of the important ones is that typically, um, whenever you have even 10% of a, of a Sentinel-2 tile, which has a free uh, clear sky, a cloud, no cloud cover, you need to pick it as an input to the system and then we realized that uh, Maya uh, was also Maya Max, sorry, was um, um, sort of overestimating the uh, cloud cover from our standpoint because what we're interested in is really monitoring also the management uh, events. So um, we did some side work to see how we could improve it, and you can see the results on the right hand side uh, that allow us to still see through uh, typically very thin clouds and high level cirrus that are usually filtered out by uh, Maya Max um, and access the surface information. Uh, for accelerant, same thing. So I think I talked about it, uh, this quite a bit. We needed to prepare accelerant for EO ingestion. Uh, it involved the development of different dashboards and uh, um, congruence, congruence analysis, uh, analysis um, interfaces. Then when we come to uh, the monitoring of crop growth and yield, so we relied on very uh, classical um, um, models of canopy structure. And uh, you can see here uh, curve fits onto uh, individual plot for rice in Senegal. Uh, we also relied on a second approach, which is developed by Université de Liège uh, called Proxy, the processing chain for parcel and regional crop yield monitoring which we also tried to apply at a parcel scale uh, with uh, various levels of success. 
Um, but I can show that on a regional scale, which is typically for us the MOI, the market of interest, so um, anywhere between a few um, tens of uh, square kilometers to a few thousand square kilometers, uh, delivers um, fairly consistent uh, results for a yield prediction. And uh, likewise, uh, if we do a simulation of these uh, EO metrics into uh, aqua crop, uh, to recalibrate the model, we can also achieve uh, some fairly good results. However, uh, when you look at similar methods applied at the parcel scale, uh, you face a number of problems. And if you look at the left-hand side, these are the various curve fits that um, we um, built uh, between um, a large set of parcels. And uh, you can see that the, the green to brownish shape is a, a color representation of the final yield. And you can see that there's essentially no relationship between the curve fit and the final yield as it is reported from the field. And that is a very major constraint and it is uh, in part linked to uh, the quality of the field data which is obtained. Uh, bearing in mind that the field data is not collected by people paid by uh, research grants, but uh, people who actually uh, are monitoring agricultural contracts uh, for smallholders. Uh, uh, Chair, are, yeah. or Sibri, excuse me, Sibri, to let you know, um, you're at time, a little over. Um, okay. We don't have any questions, so if you just want to wrap up quickly and then we can head into the general Q&A, that will be great. Thank you. Absolutely. So that's the uh, last uh, set of figures I wanted to show to um, um, present that on peanut, for example, the green update as extracted from the time series is the best predictor of final yield on a very simple statistical model. But then when you look at uh, um, a full set of field data, which is uncurated, uh, then this uh, very um, significantly affects the quality of that, uh, that uh, predictive power. So, um, we have learned, and perhaps uh, for the sake of time, I will uh, skip the, um, the, the, um, the details of the individual pilots, but uh, come to the final conclusion, saying that, um, as expected, um, e the flooding date is a very mature EO product that can e immediately be implemented to reduce the cost of uh, field verification by uh, field crew. Uh, peanut in rain-fed crops is a kind of a textbook case of a, a clean EO signal, so we think it has very good potential for yield modeling once uh, uh, field data is curated. Uh, for sorghum, it's a bit much bigger problem because I would say mostly of the mixed cropping and the cloud coverage uh, that we, we're dealing with. So I want to simply conclude by acknowledging that we also received support from uh, CCAFs, um, CGIAR, the Islamic Development Bank, which is taking up the system uh, for two million smallholders in West Africa and the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabri, for a really interesting presentation. And thank you to all of our speakers, actually. I think we had a very interesting um, session today that kind of showed uh, similar needs and similar problems, but from a couple of different perspectives. Um, uh, so before we have 20 minutes before it's time for us to head over to the requirements booth where we can uh, share some of our ideas for what ESA can invest in in the future, both in terms of me uh, methods and solicitations. But we do have some kind of general uh, discussion questions that I would invite all of the speakers to answer. Um, one of them that came up in um, a general question early on, and I'm sorry I've lost it in the chat who initially asked it. Um, but it was essentially about um, privacy of data. Um, we see this a lot with field data as a concern, um, anonymity of farmers um, being important and, you know, issues of, sh of sharing that kind of data as well as other sort of privately sourced data. Um, you know, is this, how do we overcome that, those challenges? Is that inherently incompatible with the cloud, so to speak, or inherently incompatible with sort of knowledge hubs and sharing information, or are there ways that we as a community can um, can work on this effort? And I don't know if maybe it should go first to uh, Ian, since he was uh, the first speaker and had some thoughts on this initially, or I can just open the floor to everyone. Uh, maybe I'll sit back on this and see what some others have to say and pitch in. 
once I've already weighed in. But I have some feedback, if you please. Wish. So, um, indeed, when you go to countries and you propose cloud-based solution, uh, the first thing they are concerned is, of course, the security of their data. Because data is basically the, that, that's the valuable asset of the ministry, is the data. So the way that uh, we are approaching this issue is by having some uh, good conversation between the IT teams. So the IT team of the ministry and the IT team behind the UN Global Platform, so that they speak the same language in terms of protocols for data security, data access, uh, data authentication, user authentication. You know, uh, for example, we, we now we work with Amazon Web Services, and we have you know all of those uh, uh, solution diagram where we show that basically the workspace of the ministry in the Amazon Web Services is going to be accessible only to them. So it's really really secure. But of course. You need to engage with them, and you need to have the, 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 the technical discussion between uh, the people who understand about security in the cloud. Sophie speaking, if I may add something about that. So uh, this is a question that came to us very early in the Send for Step project. Um, we were asked to think about a solution uh, because Send for Step probably will, be the, will, will run on the, on the cloud. And so we are working on a development of a machine to machine protocol, meaning that uh, the send for stat system or uh, it's any system, it's possible that the systems read directly the data and the data remain uh, on the server of the user. There, there are some protocol now that uh, ensure this privacy that the users do not have to upload their data on the cloud. So this is kind of en encryption and protocol with API, etc., to access the, uh, to access the data. So I'm not uh, the IT uh, person of the of the project, so I cannot give the full details, but just to add that there are also uh, technical solutions that exist. And that's clear that as a community, we, we, we could look at them uh, if, if it may uh, lower the barriers. So maybe I can speak now. How's that? <laughs> Do it. So I just hesitate to speak again without hearing from the people that are actually in the field dealing with the, um, you know, the, the institutions that have these concerns because they really know what's happening. But yeah, I think there's, um, in terms of in-situ data and cloud, uh, it's uh, there's technological solutions, but it's also a cultural shift. So as we see projects like Send for Stats and the FAO efforts to reach out and engage, I think we build a, we start to change that culture perhaps, and we can dem also demonstrate the value of uh, information sharing, data sharing. And it, it's an evolution, not a revolution, I always say. So these projects are really important at setting some of the groundwork, building some of the technologies that will enable it. And then uh, uh, often when one country sees something doing something, they'll start to think about possibly emulating it or, or it helps to uh, open that path, so. <clears throat> and following on to that, um, so, you know, privacy is a concern, but there's also the, the kind of underpinning importance of the data quality. And if you've got data coming from a lot of different sources, um, are they kind of inter interoperable, so to speak? And not just talking about satellite data, talking about field data and the methods with which they're collected. Um, where, how do you think we can proceed on developing standards um, around field data collection and sharing them across communities um, to maximize the value of the data that are collected? I can take that one again. I think that I, I think I have something worth saying on this. Uh, so the essential variables are going to help define some of the requirements, but the people that are already working in, in the field, the Pierre, Sophie, Lorenzo, and so on, Sergi, they they kind of know what, what's required. So a lot of those best practices that are already happening, it's just, um, I think there's a role for GeoGram to start to document them and making them more available. 
and kind of curating that that information. And then there's a lot of infrastructures that are already created, like the uh, ML Data Hub, uh, Radiant Earth, and there's other ones using stack technology. So a lot of work has been done on, on the infrastructure side. It's just a matter, I think, of uh, as a community, and that's what GeoGlam is, many on this uh, meeting are, are part of GeoGlam, coming to a consensus of, of best approaches, uh, using a federated approach uh, to meet certain standards around data and so on. So. Again, I think it's a good role for GeoGlam actually to help to establish some of these best practices and, and help uh, link to the tools. Any other comments or additions to that? Visions for how we might implement such a coordinated strategy? Mm, from my side, FAO is part of the UN task team on the use of Earth observations for agricultural statistics. And we also have, a, a, let's say, a research task team, a training task team, and so on. So at that level, of course, they are trying to push also the, the research agenda on the on the uh, identification of the optimal number of, uh, of samples, let's say, that requires to be collected for the training and calibration validation of uh, Earth observation product. So there is this tendency in trying to find what is the minimum requirements. Um, and uh, while there is this activity ongoing, uh, as it was previously mentioned, yes, there are already uh, initiatives uh, where people are trying to gather data and share this data for training purposes, to train the classifier. So the example of Radiant Earth. The question is that, um, uh, the standards with which this data have been collected is not always clear and uh, agreed upon different schools of thoughts, first of all. So we're lacking a, a global standard, I would say, in my opinion. And, and secondly, also, if you go and see really the quantity of the data that is available, it's really, really, really small. So you don't really have right now enough in my opinion, training data that could allow somebody, I don't know, to go on a freely available platform, Google Earth Engine, for example, and try to create a, a national land cover of a country or, or a crop map. I think we are still very far from there. So the role of international organizations such as uh, FAO, uh, the group on Earth Observation, GEOS, I mean, GEO, they are probably, they are those uh, international forums where this type of uh, critical mass can be reached to agree on, on standard and standard in the data collection and standard in the data sharing and how to treat then the issues of data confidentiality, for example. Excellent, thank you. Um, I asked a question earlier to Sergey um, that I, and I guess I wanna expand on it given that the topic of this session is really SDG2, Sustainable Agriculture Food Security. And I'm curious, and especially those working on sort of the development of national statistics and the development of information that would be relevant beyond statistics to SDG2 as well. How have you integrated your work specifically with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Framework? Have you found that easy to do, difficult to do? Um, and, you know, I think a lot of us recognize the technical, the barriers are beyond technical. This is principally a technical session, but I'm kind of asking for some, some of the kind of big picture questions uh, as well about how to operationalize and bring satellite data into a framework that doesn't necessarily account for satellite data now. It's a doozy. Sorry if it's too complicated. Um, if nobody has any comments on that, I'm happy to yes. ask we, another. I have some comments. I wouldn't like to monopolize the, 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 the floor, but we, if, you, if you allow me, so we've been in the process of uh, supporting the, the data uh, collection for, uh, for this year for SDG indicator 15.4.2, which is the mounting recovery index. So we're trying to support countries to generate these statistics. And clearly there is there uh, uh, a lot of grounds to use uh, land cover products. 
prepared by national authorities or the global products delivered by the Copernicus. So we've been proactively uh, uh, supporting the development of the methodology that then can be customized with the national data or can rely on, on, on global data. So I think there is the integration of uh, Earth observation with SDG monitoring is uh, progressively becoming a fact, uh, but it still requires a lot of work. Excellent. Thank you. Does anybody have any other comments on that one? Otherwise, I'll pivot to a slightly different topic, but related, because it, it's all related, isn't it? So um, I'm looking ahead to the requirements booth here. Um, and so they're liking, they're, they're hoping that people will discuss how Earth observations can make a difference for supporting national statistics, which we've gone pretty far into, small hoarder farming, which we saw in, uh, in particular with Sibiri's presentation, but then also soil and crop monitoring. Um, and we didn't really talk much about soils today. Um, and I'm kind of curious to on, to see if there anybody in here has perspectives that they would like to share about the ways in which we can utilize satellite remote sensing, which typically observes above ground sort of phenomena and biomass to better understand what's happening in the soil. Um, I know I'm sort of entrenched in this in the European perspective, but less clear, I mean, in the American perspective, but I'm a little bit less clear on what's going on in Europe. Um, and I think this is a great forum to, to maybe start that discussion. I could prob probably provide a little um, uh, feedback from the smallholder agriculture perspective. I think one of the the, the, the big uh, issues that we are dealing with again is that the the variability of um, crop response in a smallholder agricultural landscape will be very inf strongly influenced by management. So um, it will be difficult to make inferences about uh, soil conditions or uh, soil status until such time that you have also monitored. Um, things like uh, fertilizer fertilization rates. As you know, uh, crop will typically be very strongly responsive to nitrogen inputs, uh, but nitrogen is not something that you um, know comes from the soil most of the time. It comes from the inputs that the, the farmers actually provide. And this is not something that can be uh, easily uh, known other than by uh, through field data collection. So um, I think that for us to be able to monitor soil health, for example, from uh, Copernicus data, we really need to have a very strong field data collection component associated. Yes, I wonder, I mean, field data collection is seems like such an important topic. Um, and we're, you know, in, in cases where you have people out there collecting certain data already, adding on additional samples that might represent, um, you know, what's happening in the soils and what's happening to, to runoff and things like that, I think would be um, an important thing for us as a community to consider when we design guidelines or, or talk about things that are, you know, really impactful and useful uh, for agriculture and, and in specific, specifically the SDGs and, and, you know, climate change as well, of course. Um, there, we did receive one question, and we've got just two minutes left before we head to the requirements booth. So I'll ask this again from Hervé Cardelez, and I'm so sorry if I'm saying your name poorly. Uh, collecting ground data is often a limitation. Are there methods that do not need current season land cover data, for example, that may use data from previous years? Um, and I assume that this is per, per, um, particularly a mapping question. Or I guess you could see about using yield from from prior years to train a model as well. Um, maybe, so. maybe I can 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 take this first because I think that was not quite clear in my presentation um, with our crop mapping approach because I got so many questions about the um, the data that we use um, for training and we do not need uh, or we do not use uh, current season training data. 
um, we get the crop dynamic, the crop development from the crop growth model. Um, and we see in the satellite imagery how um, the crop is um, growing currently. So, so we can see how under current meteorological conditions, um, winter wheat, for example, should be um, developing and, and then can make a classification from there. Um, so we only use ground data, in situ data, after the fact, after the season, when they're available, um, to validate that what we did is um, correct. Um, but yeah, that was one of the, of, the, of the big requirements that we had for our crop classification, that it has to be something that can be done um, without using in situ data, also that we can, um, that we can scale the services and, and add new countries um, with relative little difficulty. So, um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And um, I do see now we have one other question from my co-chair, Marie, who's has a very noisy building in this moment. Um, but the question is, how do you manage the consistency between local and regional forecasting and national global forecasting? I can take that on in the context of, uh, you know, the geogram crop monitor, harvest monitoring type work, I think. Um, my, well, it's really my vision or idea is that um, a lot of the work came out of uh, global uh, data sets that were fairly coarse in nature, MODIS uh, in particular, NDVI data sets, a lot, a lot of the initial work and still is kind of the uh, workhorse today. So that that's great. Um, but now that we're working uh, at regional and national levels and we're starting to work in more and more uh, Sentinel and SAT products, um, the resolution and the act, presumably the accuracy should be improving. Working at national scale, we're not only using high resolution data, but we're getting uh, more, probably more and better uh, information from the ground on conditions. So ultimately, I think we started with a top-down process where we had the global systems and then we tried to build regional and national systems under it. Ultimately, as the whole thing matures, and this is over a fair period of time, I think we're going to see more of a bottom-up where we have really strong national monitoring in most countries and we take that information and bring it up to the regional scale. So both ways ensure some uh, continuity between the different scales, but I think bottom-up is ultimately best if you have a very strong uh, system at that level. Thank you. Any other comments from other speakers or uh, other folks on the line, I guess, before we conclude? All right, well, I guess that means we've solved it. So, <laughs> so thank you so much, all of you, for um, your really interesting presentations today. Thank you also to the audience for um, sending your lively questions over and tuning in. A reminder one more time that over on the Brella platform, platform we have um, the requirements booth opening now. I think Marie and I will endeavor to be there for the next um, hour or so to moderate discussion, but I do think this is a really great opportunity for you to give direct feedback to ESA um, with an eye to the future about where we really need to take this community of agricultural monitoring. So again, thank you very much. Um, Marie, if it's possible, you can also say goodbye. <laughs> if it's too loud where you are, then I'll say goodbye for you. I guess it's very loud where she is now. So um, thank you from on behalf of Marie as well. Uh, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.